And today we are going to continue our series assessing the Book of Mormon in dialogue with uh, um, believing Mormon scholarship. Just to briefly uh, recap the aims of this video series, what I want to do is to analyze Book of Mormon apologetics and Book of Mormon scholarship uh, in a critical way to show that uh, apologetic scholarship for the authenticity of the Book of Mormon ultimately is not successful, but also to present this case from someone who is a believer in, in traditional Christianity. Um, so I'm not sure if I mentioned this in the past video, but today most criticism of the Book of Mormon and its historical authenticity is made by liberal or naturalist ex-Mormons. And so, for example, uh, the presence of Isaiah 40 to 55, quote unquote, Deutero Isaiah, which I believe is, was produced by the prophet himself and his immediate disciples, uh, that is the presence of those chapters in the Book of Mormon has taken an increasingly central role in uh, criticism of its historical authenticity. The argument goes that these chapters were not even written when Lehi allegedly left Jerusalem before the Babylonian exile. So their presence in the Book of Mormon is an anachronism and, an, uh, and is indicative that the text is not authentic. Well, I can't roll with that, nor can uh, anyone who holds to traditional views of the Bible, which, mean, which includes a belief in the unity of the prophetic books, such as Isaiah. Um, and let me say briefly, for those Christians who want to uh, split Isaiah up and take the conventional view on quote-unquote Deutero Isaiah. Um, the big pr theological problem with this view of Isaiah is that in those chapters of Isaiah, what the God of Israel is doing, he's calling the pagan gods to account, and he's vindicating his own superiority over and against the pagan gods. And what is the principal sign that he is the sovereign Lord? It's that he can tell history before it happens. He knows the end from the beginning. So, for example, he can give the personal name of the king who's going to liberate the Jews from the Babylonian exile. It is not an incidental point that the specific name of King Cyrus is given uh, a century and a half prior to his uh, liberation of the Jews from the Babylonian exile. In fact, that's essential, the entire message of the book. Uh, if the book is written after Cyrus frees the Jews from exile, uh, not only is the theological point undermined, but we're dealing with a case of outright fraud, and there's no skirting around that. So I wanted to give an argument against Book of Mormon historicity that does not focus on these things, which will equally undermine traditional Christian belief. Uh, so in the last video, we talked about uh, what the Book of Mormon is, how it presents itself. We talked about the uh, plate records that it's supposed to have been based upon. Uh, we talked about... Uh, Kind of the general issues which are do dominating Book of Mormon debates these days. Today I want to get into more of the nitty-gritty of actually engaging with these apologetic arguments. And I don't use the word apologetic in a pejorative way at all. I do not consider apologist to be a bad word. Uh, I myself am an apologist at times. An apologist is someone who defends a particular set of beliefs. I'm also not interested in questions of motive or especially questions of methodology. People who say that academia works by assembling a wide variety of data and proceeding from data to theory obviously are clueless or deluded about the way that the academy including the sciences history and so on actually works mormon scholars if they're credentialed in the relative field or have a record of publication in those relevant fields they're scholars and i'm not going to question that um, okay so how do we actually frame this question so here is where i think 50 percent or more of the errors in apologetic arguments get made. It's not about asking the question, is the Book of Mormon a historical text, full stop. So it's not, is the Book of Mormon ancient? If you ask the question that way, well then you can make a whole set of apparently compelling arguments by noting a feature of the Book of Mormon text and noting the presence of that feature in antiquity, in the ancient world of Lehi's day or in the ancient world of Mesoamerica. This is not the way we should be framing the question. Instead, what we have to do is analyze the text of the Book of Mormon in terms of two production contexts. So if we say that the Book of Mormon is not a text produced in antiquity, 
by uh, ancient Mesoamericans of roughly Israelite extraction, then by implication, we are saying that the text is a product or is produced within the world of Joseph Smith or one of his rough contemporaries. Um, so if it doesn't exhibit characteristics of the ancient world, or if it's not produced within that context, it should exhibit characteristics of the 19th century. Now this has some very important implications because it affects how significantly we take a particular connection with the ancient world. So let's take, for example, the idea of the heart. So most arguments I think made by LDS scholars are better than this, but this is particularly striking because of how bad it was for me. Um, in the uh, documentary uh, Journey of Faith, The New World, which is a documentary made by LDS scholars about the Book of Mormon's alleged Mesoamerican context, um, Mark Allen Wright, who is a um, scholar of the ancient Maya, he's a scholar of the Mesoamerican world and of Mesoamerican archaeology, he's a true and good scholar, uh, but he suggests in a very brief clip from this documentary that the emphasis on the language of the heart and the idea of the heart as the center of the person in the Book of Mormon is indicative of a connection to the culture of ancient Mesoamerica. Now, anyone who knows Mesoamerica knows that the heart is uh, profoundly important to the Mesoamerican symbolic worldview. Uh, human sacrifice is focused on the extraction of the heart uh, in particular. And it's true, that is in the Book of Mormon, and it's central in the Mesoamerican world. But when we understand and frame this question in terms of a comparative analysis, and not in terms of an analysis of the Book of Mormon re relative to the ancient world alone, well, then this is not remarkable at all, because one of Joseph Smith's principal uh, influences is the KJV 1769 Bible. And anyone who knows the Old and New Testaments knows the heart is just as central in the symbolic worldview of these texts. The Spirit of God enters into the heart in Galatians 4. And that's just one of a mountain of biblical texts. And many of the passages in which the Book of Mormon lays an emphasis on the heart are quotations or verbal echoes of texts from Hebrew Bible in the New Testament. Another thing that Mark Allen Wright says in, these, uh, in this documentary is that the tripartite cosmology of ancient Mesoamerica is shared in a particular and striking way by the text of the Book of Mormon. So uh, ancient Mesoamericans they talked about a three-storied universe uh, with the waters under the earth, the land, and then the heaven above. Now, if you look at the text in which this uh, three-storied universe is mentioned in the Book of Mormon, it's in a speech by Abinadi, you realize that he's actually quoting the Ten Commandments. And it's Exodus 20 which mentions this three-storied cosmology. So this is no argument for historicity because it is a feature that, while present in both the Book of Mormon and ancient America, is also equally present in Joseph Smith's America and in his probable, and in this case, certain literary influences. Now, this argument actually cuts both ways, because if you find a feature of the text that is present in both the world of Joseph Smith and the ancient world, well, then it doesn't constitute an argument for its modern production context either. If a feature of the Book of Mormon is present in both Joseph's world and the ancient world in which it is supposed to have been engraved, well, then it's a wash, ultimately. Now, the way in which the feature is present um, uh, can be nuanced in certain ways that it will cut uh, slightly to one side or another. Uh, it is also not about what people of Joseph Smith's day would find plausible. If you listen to LDS apologetics and scholarship all the time, you will hear this phrase or something like it. This was absurd or crazy to people of Joseph Smith's time or 19th century Yankees, but we now know it to be a feature of the ancient world. Or historians and scholars of Joseph Smith's time, or of 100 or 150 years ago, 
thought this was absurd in the Book of Mormon, but now we know it to be true. But this is a misframing of the issue. We are not asking what scholars of ancient Central America in Joseph Smith's world and its immediate aftermath were saying about um, ancient America. That doesn't matter. We're not asking what an educated person of Smith's world thought about ancient America. Nobody says that an educated person, in terms of having an academic education of Smith's world, wrote the Book of Mormon. No, we are saying that the text of the Book of Mormon is produced by Joseph Smith, a, per, a uh, lay person, a brilliant lay person, but a lay person nevertheless. He had no formal academic education, as Elias Paul just so often emphasized. A lay person who was uh, uh, involved in uh, some degree of folk magic uh, and folk magical traditions. Uh, who was familiar with the KGV Bible, who was familiar with popular ideas about ancient America, which may have not been shared by the scholars of Smith's day, but were believed by a lot of common people. Um, and so even if a particular feature of the Book of Mormon would have been absurd to someone like Charles Anthon, a scholar of Smith's day, that doesn't mean it would have been absurd to Joseph Smith. And if it was plausible to Joseph Smith, then there's nothing remarkable about its presence in the Book of Mormon, whom non-believers believe was written generally by Joseph Smith. And I should also say that I've noticed that Mormon scholars and apologists will often claim that a particular feature of the Book of Mormon text was absurd to people in Joseph Smith's day without giving any real documentation. And I almost wonder whether in many cases this is just done out of force of habit rather than out of rigorous scholarship and knowledge of Joseph Smith's own world. So while you have a lot of scholars of ancient Mesoamerica, uh, esteemed scholars of ancient Mesoamerica, uh, taking seriously the Book of Mormon, they really are only experts in half of the issue. Uh, just as important as no knowledge of the ancient world is knowledge of Joseph Smith's world. And my argument, and the argument of the unbelieving approach to the Book of Mormon in general, is that the better you know the culture of a person like Joseph Smith in the 19th century, the better you will understand the Book of Mormon, the more perfectly the Book of Mormon fits into a modern production context. And so we have to compare how well the Book of Mormon fits into its alleged ancient production context with how well it might fit in a modern production context. Here's another example very common uh, uh, idea. It's the idea that the notion of engraved metal plates was absurd to someone in Joseph Smith's day. But now we know that engraved plates uh, are a, a key feature of ancient writing. Now I discussed this a bit in my last video. I discussed how it can't be constructed as a motif of the Near Eastern world because uh, plates is supposed to have been a feature of the Jaredites as well as the Lehites. But it was not, in fact, absurd to people in Joseph Smith's world. Fawn Brody documents in her book, as I mentioned, how uh, uh, people reported, to, reported finding metal records in the Indian mountains, which I would argue form the context of Smith's uh, Book of Mormon, of Smith's world, uh, of Smith's understanding of ancient America. And I would point out that no text anywhere close to the size of the Book of Mormon, and it's, you know, it has the entire um, Torah plus biblical and non-biblical prophets on this book of brass plates. No text like that has ever been found in the ancient world. So we, with the issue of metal plates, it is found in both the ancient world and in Joseph Smith's world. But when we look at the kind of writing that is alleged to uh, have been written on metal plates by uh, Mormons. Uh, when we look at the kind of book the Book of Mormon is supposed to have been, we find that it fits better in Joseph Smith's world than it does in the ancient world. Now, moving on from that, probably the most important point I have to emphasize on this slide is that framing the question of Book of Mormon historicity does not require the non-Mormon 
to explain how the text was produced. Okay, so LDS scholars, when they're debating a, a non-Mormon, they will often say, well, the Book of Mormon, it's a remarkable text. It's this internally complex document, which has a remarkable coherence, despite its being dictated in a relatively short period of time. And that's all true. And they say, non-Mormons cannot come to a consensus on how the text was produced. And that's true as well. But it does not require the non-Mormon to explain how the text was produced, to have intellectual warrant, to have epistemic warrant, to conclude that it was produced in the modern world. If the text of the Book of Mormon reflects the world of the 19th century, and particularly Joseph Smith's 19th century, then you can conclude that it was produced within that world without understanding how it could have been produced. So imagine that you uh, you find uh, an ancient or a, a papyrus in the sands of the Sahara Desert. It perfectly matches what exactly what you would expect from ancient Egypt, except it says, "I am glad Abraham Lincoln was president is president of the United States." Now this is an absurd example, but I use it to illustrate an important point, which is that the content of this papyrus is alone sufficient to demonstrate that it must have been pr produced in uh, or after Abraham Lincoln's presidency, even though everything else about it seems to indicate antiquity. And even though the uh, Egyptologist has no explanation for how this text got produced and buried in the sands of Egypt, you don't need to explain how a text was produced to conclude that it was produced in a particular when and where, in a particular production context. That has to depend on the internal features of the texts. The how question is then answered by a variety of believing or unbelieving models. So a few unbelieving models, Spalding Rigdon theory. Uh, we may get into this in a bit. Uh, the Spalding Rigdon theory is that Solomon Spalding, who was a, a, a minister, though really a rationalist, not a, not a believer in the truth claims of Christianity in Conneaut, Connecticut, uh, that he wrote a manuscript. It was kind of a novel written in biblical style in the old KGV literary form. He wrote a novel about the 10 tribes in America. And it's the idea that Sidney Rigdon, an influential leader in early Mormonism, um, that he stole this manuscript and inserted theological orations in the Book of Mormon that reflected his own theology, and that this kind of combined text became the Book of Mormon. Okay, so that's one model for how the text was produced. Another model is that Joseph Smith dictated it from his own mind, that Smith created it. Okay, so Spalding, Rigdon, uh, the majority unbelieving model says Spalding Rigdon has no basis, but it was produced by Smith. Uh, some unbelieving models say Oliver Cowdery was in on it. Some say it was Joseph Smith alone. So my point is you can have a wide variety of answers to the how question, which all agree in locating it in the 19th century. The same is actually true of believing models. So how was the Book of Mormon produced? Well, Royal Skousen, who's the preeminent expert on the uh, original written manuscript of the Book of Mormon, we have about a fifth of that left, uh, argues that Joseph looked at a seer stone and God gave him a word-for-word -word translation, which was in uh, 16th century English. So it's not just that it was in King James English. Skousen argues that the grammar of it is 16th century English in a way that couldn't have been derived from the KGB. Whereas uh, Brant Gardner, another LDS scholar, in his Gift and Power Translating the Book of Mormon, uh, Gardner holds that when Smith looks, looked into his seer stone, God communicated the pre-verbal meaning of the text directly to Smith's mind. And then Smith processed that and digested that through his subconscious and conscious mind. And that the digested form of that, which is being mediated through Smith's mind, is what appears in the seer stone. So the seer stone, and, and Gardner um, draws on some anthropological research on those people who do see things in seer stones, because there are some people who do see things in seer stones, including people who see writing in seer stones. Um, uh, Gardner draws on that to say that, okay, so Smith's subconscious is digesting the pre-verbal meaning of the plates, 
that is being given to him directly by God. And then the seer stone is a mechanism or instrument through which information that is latent in his subconscious becomes available to his conscious mind and he dictates that out. So these are two very different models for how the Book of Mormon text comes to us. Another model, which is a believing model, is Blake Ostler's uh, famous or infamous expansion theory. So this is the idea that uh, Joseph Smith, in giving us the Book of Mormon, um, he, uh, he translates the material that's engraved in the plates but he also expands the text from his own 19th century background. And that's why it has theology that's unique to the 19th century and is unlikely to have been present in the ancient world. Uh, that's why it uses revival language that would have been available to Smith's backyard. Uh, but Osler frames it so that he can uh, supposedly explain both the ancient and the modern features of the text. And my general impression, actually, is that something like Osler's expansion theory is becoming more and more popular than LDS scholars. So um, this is because the more you look at the Book of Mormon, the more evident it becomes that there's a lot of New Testament in the Book of Mormon. Um, there are stories which look like they're directly derived from the New Testament. Okay, So there's New Testament language, not just a few words here and there from the KGV, but whole texts which are... Uh, processed through Smith's mind and become something like Moroni 10, which is clearly rooted in 1 Corinthians 12 in a complex way. So someone like um, Grant Hardy, uh, he he holds to something like the expansion theory. Um, there's a professor at, at BYU who looks at the way the Book of Mormon uses the New Testament. Um, so he says we have to separate the Book of Mormon as a text from the gold plates as a text. He says these are two related but different texts. Um, so my impression is that this is becoming more and more popular among LDS scholars. I don't think it ultimately works. And I think at that point you have to just, you're, you're approaching the level where you have to come to see that it's just a more parsimonious explanation um, from a rational point of view um, to say it's a product of the 19th century and we don't need gold plates. Um, at that point, the LDS may say, okay, I acknowledge from an evidential point of view, that's the truth of things, but I have a spiritual witness. And that's a different issue, whether that's a legitimate epistemology. We might address that in a future video. Um, so, in order to conclude the Book of Mormon is produced by Joseph Smith or someone in his rough context, you do not need to explain how it was produced. Those are two related but different questions. So it doesn't work for the LDS scholar or apologist to, um, after seeing this information indicative of a 19th century origin, challenge the um, uh, non-believer and its historicity to explain how it was produced. So this is the premise of a lot of Mormon apologetics. Hugh Nibley's Book of Mormon Challenge, for example, I think is, is implicitly predicated on this idea that if you can't explain how it was produced, then the best explanation is that it was produced as a translation from engraved gold plates. Um, I don't think that follows. Okay, now we have to address the question of whether the Book of Mormon text has changed. This is so important because a great deal of LDS scholarship uh, is based on this idea. So John Clark, in a lecture given to a fair, uh, a FAIR conference. So FAIR is the foundation for apologetic information and research. It's the uh, preeminent Mormon apologetic um, organization. And so they have a conference every year and various scholars and apologists um, come and give talks. Um, a lot of them are very interesting talks. Um, but John Clark is a, a, a very good esteemed Mesoamerican archaeologist. But he says, well, the Book of Mormon has not changed. It's the same Book of Mormon, basically speaking, that we have from 1830. And so if a feature that was not intelligible in an ancient context in 1830 has now become intelligible, it's because the archaeology has moved, not the Book of Mormon. The Book of Mormon is fixed. The archaeological understanding, our understanding of the ancient world, that has changed. And if they've come closer together, it must be because uh, scholarship has been moving closer and closer to the Book of Mormon. The Book of Mormon has not moved. Uh, Don Sorensen makes this argument. This is uh, like the idea that the non-believer can't explain how the book was produced. This is absolutely pervasive. You hear it all the time. But what, what I want to argue is that this is not true. 
So there are two ways in which the text uh, has changed. The first is superficial. So lots of people get a lot of mileage, a lot of critics of Mormonism get a lot of mileage pointing out how many changes there have been in the text of the Book of Mormon. And, you know, superficially, this is true. Uh, there have been a lot of changes, most of which remove um, uh, a bad English grammar, some of which were uh, Joseph Smith cleaning up the text during uh, his own lifetime. Uh, there are a few changes which are theologically significant. So, for example, um, the original Book of Mormon and indeed a lot of passages in the text as we have it seem to indicate a kind of confused modalist Christology where Jesus is identical to the person of the Father. Um, it's not clear to me that every text can be explained in a modalist um, uh, by, by a modalist Christology. It seems to me that Smith was, was a bit confused about it uh, and continued to be for a few years. Um, uh, but uh, these texts get changed by Smith. So in First Nephi, uh, Nephi is a vision of the mother of God and uh, the angel interprets the vision and says, this is the mother of God. Well, later on, this gets changed to the mother of the son of God. Changes like that are theologically significant, especially when you can correlate them to changes in Smith's theology, which are documented outside of changes to the Book of Mormon text. So when these two things are converging, it seems to indicate uh, that something real is going on. Like if the earliest account of the first vision only has Jesus appearing. And then at the same time, Smith is altering the text of the Book of Mormon to distinguish the son from the father. You find that now you have two personages, the father and the son. That would seem to be significant in a way that's not um, easily explicable by a believing Mormon model. Uh, but most of these changes are, are not particularly um, significant. Uh, and they only constitute problems for a very, very tight model of the Book of Mormon translation. Uh, that is where the translation in its word-for-word -word form is given from the mouth of God, from the, from the Holy Spirit. And even there, you can say Joseph shouldn't have changed the text, so we need to go back to our 1830 Book of Mormon. And that's not really what I'm interested in. What I'm interested in is, the, is shifts in interpretive paradigm. So this is the way in which the Book of Mormon text, in fact, has changed enormously. Uh, when we ask does this or that text correspond to our knowledge of the ancient world? We're not asking about the text, you know, taken in itself. There is no text taken in itself. Every text is interpreted. Inter interpretation may be straightforward, it may be rather difficult, but every text is mediated by an interpreter or an interpretive community. Um, and a significant connection between the Book of Mormon and the ancient world should come about when we get at the meaning of the text deduced from the text alone. So we don't actually need to know anything about the ancient world to understand that it means X. And then we find that X is true of the ancient world. If part of the evidence for the Book of Mormon saying X is that X feature is part of the ancient world, well, then it's not an independent convergence. It's uh, obviously you'll get the ancient world in the Book of Mormon because you're feeding data from the ancient world into your interpretation of what the Book of Mormon is supposed to say. And my argument is that LDS scholars do this a lot, including at times when they don't really recognize um, that they're doing it. Um, so the best way to get closest to an objective evaluation of what the Book of Mormon would say to someone who has no knowledge of ancient America is to look at what the LDS Church believed that the Book of Mormon said prior to widespread knowledge of ancient America. So let's take a look at it. Uh, here is what I would argue is a prima facie reading of the Book of Mormon. So today, LDS scholars hold that the Book of Mormon took place in a limited geography. That means it took place in a relatively uh, small geographic area, um, uh, roughly the size of uh, ancient Israel, or maybe a bit, a bit larger. And it doesn't matter which Mormon scholar you're talking to, or even which model of Book of Mormon geography you're looking at, almost every single serious defender of the Book of Mormon takes a limited geography view. So it might be in Mesoamerica. This is where pretty much all scholars of the Book of Mormon hold it is. Might be in the North American heartland. So this is basically the Eastern United States, including upstate New York. This has become very, very popular in recent years among lay readers of the Book of Mormon. Uh, 
under the influence of people like uh, Wayne May and uh, Rod Meldrum. Um, uh, it might be in Baja, California. So this is a reading that's uh, argued by uh, Father Son Team. Um, uh, they have a website, a choiceland.com or .org or something like that. Um, but everyone agrees that it's limited in its geography. And everyone also agrees that there is a very substantial contribution from indigenous populations who pre-existed the Lehites, okay? So, uh, and that population is Asiatic. So, unless you are a certain kind of proponent of the heartland model, North American heartland, which you aren't really gonna be dealing with, um, you hold that pretty much the entire uh, genetic landscape for indigenous Americans uh, is Asiatic. So it's the, the question is usually asked, well, could a very small Israelite population come and assimilate um, into pre-existing populations and lose their Near Eastern genetic signature? And yeah, um, the evidence indicates that that is actually technically possible. But really, that doesn't settle the question because we have to look at whether this is compatible with what the Book of Mormon says about him, itself and what the Book of Mormon is supposed to do. So on the right side, you can see two pictures. Uh, one of them is Joseph Smith preaching to a bunch of American Indians. And then below that, you see a, our particular hemispheric geography. So the hemispheric geography is the traditional view of the Book of Mormon, almost certainly held by Smith himself, definitely held by his prophetic successors, um, uh, even at, in, in Gordon Hinckley's. Um, presidency over the church. Uh, when he goes and he blesses a temple in the Western United States, he speaks of the uh, Native Americans who are present as children of Father Lehi. So um, I've never been LDS and I don't know Mormon culture um, from direct experience, but my impression is that this is actually what most Mormons continue to believe, um, that the book describes the history of the Americas and that Native Americans are descended from uh, the Lehites, that they are the Lamanites. So Lamanite and Native American are the same thing. So two different names for the same population group. Uh, LDS scholars say, no, we have to distinguish Native American from Lamanite. Uh, these are not the same group of people. So what does the text of the Book of Mormon say? Well, from a prima facie reading of the Book of Mormon, it is extremely difficult to believe that this kind of reading could be um, derived from the text independent of historical evidence. We're going to look at some arguments for a limited geography from the internal text in a bit, um, but I just want to look at uh, uh, you know, a straightforward reading of what it, what it says. So take a look at 2 Nephi 1. This is what Lehi says. Yeah, is speaking of this land, the land of promise, um, which is given to him and his descendants. He says, Behold, it is wisdom that this land should be kept as yet from the knowledge of other nations. For behold, many nations would overrun the land, that there would be no place for an inheritance. And then later on, And they shall be kept from all other nations, that they may possess this land unto themselves. And there are other texts in First and Second Nephi which talk about the coming of Gentiles to the Americas, speaking of Columbus uh, and his immediate successors. So if you're just reading this, you don't know anything about ancient America, there's no way that you're going to get an American continent which is populated by enormous indigenous civilizations. Uh, we're supposed to believe that the Book of Mormon is totally compatible with and even indicates a situation in which not only are there indigenous outsiders who precede the Lehites and are not Jaredite, but that the land is already basically overrun by them, that there is these developed cultures and civilizations which the Lehites assimilate into. So the idea is that Nephi and Laman take a leadership role in large groups of indigenous populations, and then together they kind of fuse and become uh, what we then call the Nephites and the Lamanites. But the problem here is not only 
that the Book of Mormon does not seem to give any room for indigenous and outsiders, but it, that, it, it places theological significance on this lack of indigenous outsiders. The whole idea is that God gives Lehi and his children a divine promise that this is his land. And because it's his land, the Gentiles, other nations, are not going to know about it so that he will have a place for an inheritance, so that his descendants can spread abroad. And as long as they're faithful, the knowledge of this land will be kept from other nations. Now, it's very hard to get a bunch of indigenous outsiders into the text unless you're looking at archaeological evidence, or unless you're looking at our knowledge of ancient America. Uh, now, what about the hemispheric geography of the Book of Mormon? What does a prima facie reading of the text indicate? Well, there's lots of passages which are relevant to our understanding of the Book of Mormon geography. Uh, but the most geographic text in the Book of Mormon is generally taken to be Alma 22. And I just want you, if you're Mormon or non-Mormon, to take a look at this text and see you know, what it says. So keep in mind that Smith is producing this text in a cultural environment where lots of people are saying the Native Americans are descendants of the Ten Tribes, full stop. Now, the Book of Mormon doesn't give exactly that narrative. Okay? It does not say that the Ten Tribes are here in the Americas. Uh, in fact, Jesus seems to indicate that the Ten Tribes are off somewhere else. This is a broken branch from one of those Ten Tribes, from the tribe of Joseph, plus Zarahemla, which is from the tribe of Judah, uh, which is spread abroad through the land. But if we know that this is in Joseph Smith's environment, uh, and we take the hypothesis that the Book of Mormon is a non-historical text produced by someone who's talking about the whole Western Hemisphere. See how well this fits in. We have an East Sea, and we have a West Sea. Uh, and we have a land north, and we have a land south. And between the land north and the land south, there is a narrow neck of land. Now, very importantly, for our understanding of what this narrow neck is, I have bolded part of the text here. We are told that the Nephites, with their armies, uh, who have now settled in the land northward, are able to lock out the Lamanites. They're able to uh, uh, fill the narrow neck of land with a density that is sufficient to keep Lamanites from coming up through the land. Now, the Isthmus of Tuahantepec, which John Sorensen says is the narrow neck of land, and this is uh, what almost all Mesoamerican uh, models or Book of Mormon geography say, the Isthmus of Tuahantepec is not plainly visible as a narrow neck of land unless you're looking from a bird's eye view. So if you have never you know, flown in the air or looked at a map which has been drawn by people who have flown in the air, it seems to be pretty much like the other lands in Central America you're not going to be able to see both oceans while standing in the Isthmus of Tehuantepec. It's something like 100 miles across from my memory. Now, the way that Mormon scholars uh, say that it's a narrow neck is they take passages talking about how long it takes to get across it, and they say these passages are probably given from the point of view of a military um, messenger who's running at a very fast pace. Now, regardless of whether that's a plausible interpretation of the text, I don't know how you're going to hem the Lamanites into the land southward on the Isthmus of Tehuantepec. Imagine the population density that is necessary to, as a matter of continuing policy, hem the Lamanites in on the south, that they shouldn't come into the north and have possession there, that they shouldn't overrun the land northward, that it be kept Nephite exclusive. This makes very good sense in terms of a hemispheric model. You got a land north, you got a land south. They're surrounded by an east sea an east, and, a, and a west sea. And then there's a narrow neck which you can fill uh, uh, with such a high population density that you can keep who you want from coming through that narrow neck. Uh, that is very uh, difficult to reconcile with a limited geography, but it's what we would expect to see by someone who is producing a book uh, from just kind of a popular understanding of the Americas. Okay, this is how you would describe the Western Hemisphere off the top of your head. Uh, now I want you to, to see one other thing, which is representative of a lot of the 
um, problems with the Lamanite issue. So this is from the preface to the Book of Mormon, which is written by Moroni. Um, Moroni says that he has written this book to the Lamanites, who are a remnant of the house of Israel, which is a show unto the remnant of the house of Israel, what great things the Lord hath done for their fathers, that they may know the covenants of the Lord, that they are not cast off forever. And so in the Doctrine and Covenants, um, God commands the early Mormons to go preach to the Lamanites. Now, the reason that they're going and preaching to the Native Americans as the Lamanites is not just that the Lamanites need to be converted. It's that the Lamanites, the Native Americans, in the early Mormon understanding, are a broken branch of the house of Israel, and that the second coming in the millennium is marked by the apocalyptic event of the regathering of Israel, and that preaching and converting the Lamanites through the Book of Mormon is the instrument by which this event will happen. Now consider what LDS scholars are saying today. What they're saying today is that, well, the Book of Mormon uh, can still be historical because it is possible for a small population to be assimilated genetically into a larger pre-existing population such that their genetic signature disappears. But the problem with this is that we're not just asking whether the Book of Mormon is historical. The whole purpose that this, for which this book was produced is to remind these Lamanites who they are. Moroni 10, Moroni's promise, uh, where you ask God for a spiritual confirmation, it's not just about whether the Book of Mormon is true, it's about whether it's written to the Lamanites specifically. And the hypothetical Lamanite reader is praying and asking, am I really an Israelite? He's read this history of his people. Now he wants to know, is this about me? Are these my fathers? And God says, yes. And now the Book of Mormon has accomplished its goal of bringing another lost Israelite into the fold, thus facilitating the regathering. Now, if Lamanite and indigenous American are not the same, if they're not the same group of people, and the genetic signature of the Lehites was lost, then you can't distinguish a Lamanite from a non-Lamanite. I might as well be a Lamanite. Even if the Lamanites continued to exist in some form, the fact that you can't identify them and they can't identify themselves totally undermines what the Book of Mormon is supposed to be about. And that's the big problem with this idea that Lamanites are not identical to indigenous Americans and that we can abandon Joseph Smith's reading of the Book of Mormon without abandoning the message of the book itself. So, what's the first textual overlay that we're getting when we look at the claims the Book of Mormon makes? And remember, we're looking at the question of whether the Book of Mormon text has changed such that the movement of archaeology relative to the Book of Mormon has only been in one direction, towards convergence. My argument is that no, the Book of Mormon has changed in profound ways because what it has been understood to say has shifted so profoundly. And our best way of seeing how uh, what the Book of Mormon would be taken to mean without knowledge of ancient America is just to look at the traditional LDS understanding. It's possible, logically speaking, that everyone got it wrong, that features of the text uh, which are now illumined by ancient American archaeology were totally missed. It's possible, but it is not likely. Uh, you would have to make a pretty strong textual argument for that. And I'm going to argue in the next video that such arguments are not, uh, can, are not successful. So before, before modern archaeology, before modern study of ancient America really made its mark, Lehi and his children were understood to populate the, a completely empty land. That's what the Book of Mormon claimed. That's what the text said. That's what we're supposed to be comparing to our understanding of ancient America. But now that we've come to an understanding of ancient America, it's not the archaeology which has shifted towards the Book of Mormon. That data has been fed into our reading of the Book of Mormon, and the Book of Mormon claim has shifted. So whereas the Lehites previously populated an empty land, there was only one Jaredite left, but um, that's how uh, people even come to know that they exist. There's one Jaredite left. Um, 
you can't demythologize the text and say, well, actually, there are all these Jaredite remnants everywhere. Uh, Prima Fascia reading says there's one Jaredite left. He became known to Zarahemla. That's how knowledge of their existence was transmitted to the children of Lehi. So before they populated an empty land, well, now there's all these pre-existing indigenous cultures. In fact, those indigenous cultures are the dominant cultural force in the history of the Nephites and the Lamanites. Before the Book of Mormon is written to the Lamanites, who are the Native Americans, who are, the, who are this branch of Israel, so that they can be regathered into their Lehite land of promise through the Gentiles, that's what the Book of Mormon was understood to claim before contemporary study of these American populations. Now, through genetic study, through blood type study, uh, through uh, study of the history of America, ancient America, we know that the Native Americans are uh, uh, are entirely or almost entirely Asiatic. So now that we've come to that through scientific and historical study, now the Book of Mormon does not claim that Native Americans are preeminently Israelites by descent. Before, it was understood that the Book of Mormon describes the history of the Western Hemisphere and its inhabitants who are the Native Americans. So there's a land northward, there's a land southward. They're surrounded by a sea east, a sea west. There's a narrow neck of land which links these two lands together, and you can populate it to such a density that you're going to keep out everyone from the land south from uh, migrating into the land northward. So before contemporary understanding of ancient America, and in fact understanding that was developing uh, quite a long time ago, uh, the Book of Mormon was a description of the history of this hemisphere. Well now, that we have this information, we have this knowledge, the claim of the Book of Mormon has shifted. The text, via its interpretive overlay, has in fact changed. It now makes much more limited claims. To, uh, it's a history just of Central America or just of the North American heartland. And here's one which I haven't mentioned so far, the directional system. Before, you have a land northward, you have a land southward. What does this indicate? A land north and a land south. Now, if you look at the limited Mesoamerican geography that John Sorensen and Brant Gardner proposed, these are very closely related geographic systems. They have a few differences, but very closely related. Both agree that Tohantepec is the uh, narrow neck of land. What you realize is that it is not described, the, the, the limited Tohantepec geography is not giving us a land north and a land south. You actually have to rotate the geography uh, of Central America nearly 90 degrees to get it into conformance with the Book of Mormon, land northward and land southward. So there's this idea that you often hear among Mormon scholars that it's remarkable in and of itself that a geography derived from the text could fit so well uh, with an actual geographic location in Central America even apart from the archaeological debates. But this really loses its force when you recognize that even starting out, you have to rotate the directional system nearly 90 degrees in order to get an agreement between the text and the geography. Uh, so how is this reconciled? Well, you have to, there are various different ways that scholars uh, uh, try to explain why we have a land northward and a land southward in the text, whereas we just don't in Central America. Um, the Nephite directional system uh, has been shifted in some way. So John Thornson says there's this idea of Nephite north that they landed in Central America, um, and their positions relative to their positions in the Near East had changed so that they misunderstood what was basically uh, west as basically north and basically east as basically south. Sorensen's explanation has been based, has been essentially rejected on this point. Brant Gardner says there's this unique Mesoamerican directional system which has its own internal coherence and that it gets mistranslated by Joseph Smith uh, into the English land north and land south. But problematically, Gardner holds a loose translation model. So Smith is not giving a direct literal equivalence of uh, what's on the plates to what's in the English language. Uh, he's giving a very interpretive 
translation. So that begs the question, why are we making an exception and saying that he's incredibly woodenly literalistic when it comes to the ge geography? Regardless of what this or that LDS scholar holds is most plausible, I think this is a particularly striking example of where what the text claims and what the text is supposed to have claimed uh, is being are very two very distinct things and that the latter is shaped by our understanding of ancient America. So are there convergences? Are there striking connections between the real world of ancient Mesoamerica and the modern academic Mormon reading of the Book of Mormon? Of course there are. There are lots of them. Why is this the case? Well, a lot of the time it's because our uh, developed archaeological, scientific understanding of the history of ancient America has been fed into the text by the modern Mormon, and thus it can be read out of the text. Let me just give you one example, again from that um, uh, Journey of Faith, the New World documentary. So uh, Sorensen and Gardner, in a clip from this documentary, they say around 600 BC, shortly after this, you see a burst of cultural and civilizational development in Central America. And they say this is a convergence with the Book of Mormon. And Gardner narrates a story where Nephi comes to the land uh, and his unique cultural skills allow him to become the leader of an indigenous population. They crown him king. He leads this population uh, to a new location, and then they build the city of Nephi with these new cultural features. And then we look at the archaeology, we notice a burst of cultural development, uh, and we are struck by the convergence here. Now, I don't think Gardner is being deceptive here. I think Gardner knows ancient America very well. And I think when he reads the Book of Mormon, he sees ancient America in his mind's eye. And it's almost as if he doesn't recognize when the Book of Mormon is saying something and when the Book of Mormon plus his understanding of ancient America is saying something. On a straightforward reading, what the Book of Mormon says about Nephi's arrival is that the Lehite party comes to an empty two-continent America. They bring their seeds from the old world. We're actually told that they planted their seeds that they brought from the old world. This is not indicative of adapting into a native agricultural tradition. They plant those seeds. We're told that Laman and uh, his brothers and offspring, his, his brother Lemuel and, and their offspring, plus the Ishmaelite descendants, become threatening to the Nephites. So the Nephites leave, they build the city of Nephi. This is not about a burst of cultural development for a pre-existing culture who joins in large part with these Israelites. There's no indigenous culture mentioned here. The text doesn't say anything about that. The only way that we're getting a convergence, which is supposed to be striking, is by producing a synthetic narrative, which is neither in the archeology span nor in the Book of Mormon text, but is being produced by um, reading them together and harmonizing them. And it's only this harmonized narrative which is going to converge with ancient America. And this is not an evidence for authenticity for the very simple reason that ancient American archeology span is being read into the text. And once you read it into the text, you can read it out of the text. Okay, so uh, that's all for today. I hope you have enjoyed uh, this video. My Patreon is below, so if you are able to and would like to contribute, uh, that'd be very much appreciated, but of course, no pressure. Um, and thank you for listening slash watching.